All right, everybody, thanks for coming. Um, this is a disclaimer. We can't sue PRI if you don't like what you have to say. Promise it'll be good. So we'll <laughs> get right into it. Um, I saw a quote from Kenny Duttweiler, and it went something like, um, when people ask me how much power can I make with a turbo on my LS, I say, well, how much do you want? And I think that kind of brings the point home of why everybody loves turbos. And turbocharging has come a long way the last few years. And at this point, it's pretty safe to say it's now mainstream. You know, you go to a track, uh, there's a huge amount of turbo cars, and you go to a new car dealer lot, and it's actually difficult to buy a new car that doesn't have a turbocharger on it. And the reason is there's consensus amongst automakers that the most bang for the buck to reduce CO2 emissions is with small displacement turbocharged engines. And um, the key is automakers don't want to make cars that are boring to drive, especially for Americans. And turbochargers solve that problem. You're using a small engine, so CO2 output's relatively low, and in boost, the cars are a lot of fun and super responsive. But you know, the fact is, we think this is the golden age of turbocharging. And the technology that we're seeing right now over the last 10 years has grown substantially. And so we're going to try and share with you guys a few of the things that we've seen. Um, people love the word turbo. and this trend, like many others, went a little bit overboard. So there's turbo washing machines, turbo tax, turbo cologne, turbo boogie boards, turbo electric cars. It's kind of ridiculous. Uh, but aside from all the hype, a turbo is a really simple device. And it's two wheels connected by one shaft. You spin the turbine, and that compressor is going to spin. And everybody's heard an engine referred to as an air pump, but a turbocharger literally is an air pump. This is the side that's doing the pumping, the compressor side. And this is the side that powers it, the turbine side. And so um, you can kind of think of this as a fan. Kind of think of this side as a pinwheel. So the fan pumps air. The pinwheel gets, gets moved by, by air flow, or in this case, exhaust flow. And uh, the fact that a modern turbocharger in a production car can spin at 200,000 RPM for hundreds of thousands of miles is pretty impressive on its own. But considering how simple these devices are, it is insane how complex the names and custom options can be. And there's thousands of different sizes and shapes and materials, configurations and aero. Um, it's, it's really challenging and truly knowing what specifications to choose and what to say no to can make or break a project. And uh, here's Homer Simpson shopping for a turbo. But to really drive this point home, I'm going to go through some names of some comparable turbos. Uh, if you guys know one of them, feel free to raise your hand. I'd be impressed if any of you guys know all of them, but let's go. Uh, this is a popular precision. A Gen 2 PT6466 CEA. Not too crazy of a name, but kind of looks like a part number. Garrett GTX 3584RS. I don't know if you guys know that thing. Garrett G35 1050. It's a little bit of a better turbo, but slightly better name. Is a Borg Warner EFR 9280 ALU. I love this turbo, really great unit. I don't know if anybody knows this one. Zona Rotor, awesome turbo, but a psychotic name. XR 6564 SRX3C, and that is not the part number. That is the name of the turbo. And then here's Mitsubishi. I actually had to reduce the font size to, to get this on here, and I don't know how to pronounce an asterisk. It's a great turbo, though, and um, the name is just, it's insane. So. Your customers, when they look at this, uh, this is usually the, the face they're going to make. So you can try to explain to someone that you know, some companies might talk about a compressor inducer in the name, or other guys are talking about X inducer and mass flow or horsepower. But in the end, there's no real consistency between turbo manufacturers. And so what do the customer normally do? They rely on word of mouth. They go to a racetrack, talk to their friends, talk to shop owners, go online. And they're just trying to find somebody else who's doing a similar thing. And you know that usually gets them in the ballpark. But the problem is there's a lot of wrong information that just happens to be very popular. Oh, and uh, here's a list of some, not all, of the turbine housings for that precision turbo. Uh, and that's just one of the turbos are named. So yeah, I mean, you can narrow down a turbo, but now you've got to figure out the housings. And it is really a challenge. Put yourself in uh, the shoes of your customer. It kind of feels like this. And you know. You think about it, that customer sets an objective for what they want to accomplish. And the easiest way for them to understand if they can achieve their goal is to just duplicate what other guys are doing. In this day and age, competition and knowledge are very high. 
And so as a race shop owner or team owner or you know, even uh, uh, engine builder, if you're in the turbocharging industry, you need to have a solid understanding of what works and why beyond word of mouth. And so the practice of checking the numbers to confirm a match and you know, really check the parameters, you know, it's just not that common in the, in the uh, performance and racing world. And probably it's the best representation of how business has been done over the last 25 years in this industry. It's just word of mouth. Some guy's running that turbo and he's gonna go fast, so I'm gonna do it too. And um, you know, right about now is when some nerdy engineer like me starts extolling the virtues of the importance of compressor maps and uh, you know, I break out a napkin and start banging out some formulas or something, but the reality is that's a compressor map and very few people understand or care to read a compressor map and I totally get it. Um, this is what it feels like. You see these formulas and you're like, I don't know what any of this is. You know, you're doing hand calculations and you're trying to manually plot points and then you've got Celsius and Fahrenheit and CCs and cubic inches and pounds per minute or kilograms per second. So, you know, if you're calculating an imperial units, you gotta convert to the metric system and, and vice versa. So the reality is very few people in the racing world are gonna spend the time or the effort to perform these calculations. Uh, we believe there is a much easier way to do this and racers wanna know that what they're doing is gonna work. So we believe that with a couple basic numbers, you could look your customer in the eye and say, this is how things are gonna play out. You know, if you had a metric that you're confident in and you could basically use that to, to drive decisions either, yes, this is something that's worth investing in or no, I wanna stay away from that. And you'd be able to make the most of your opportunity and uh, the resources you have. So the idea we're gonna talk about is that with five numbers, uh, I don't know if you guys got the cards, but on the back of the card, those are the numbers you're gonna need to know to do this. Um, but those, those five numbers and a couple questions are gonna get you 70% of the way to having a, a legit proper match. And if you wanna to get to 100%, we can help you do that too. But um, this is the agenda for the rest of the hour. And after this is done, we'd love you guys to stop by our booth. It's number 2338, and uh, we could continue the conversation. We're right next to our friends at Borg Warner. And um, yeah, so here goes. Uh, my name's Jeff Racer. I founded Full Race 19 years ago. I've been obsessed with turbochargers since I was a little kid. And um, yeah, from major automakers to OEM race teams, we've been very fortunate to have some of the greatest minds in the space work with us and teach us a lot. Uh, we're always learning new things about turbocharging. It's a constantly evolving space. And so we're gonna try and share with you kind of the state of the art of where things are right now. And you know, the reality is, is if we do our jobs right, our customers can focus on driving and enjoying their vehicles instead of worrying about a turbocharger. And uh, I'm Matt Velders. I'm also a mechanical engineer. And we've both dedicated our professional careers to the field of turbocharging. But uh, beyond that, our passion drives us to see each turbo system as a piece of functional art as much as it is an engineering exercise. We have customers in over 100 countries around the world. And over that last two decades that Forest has been around, we've seen the thinking about turbochargers change. It used to be all about drag racing and horsepower. But um, now, you know, it's still relevant. Drag racing is still a thing and horsepower is, is still king, but people are drifting and they're rally racing and they're doing time attack. They're side by sides and snowmobiles and jet skis, SUVs, pickup trucks. Turbocharging has really grown a lot. Uh, but you know, when I say that inevitably, there's always guys who are like, no, none of this is new. Picking a turbocharger, you know, nothing's changed and making horsepower, I already know all that. And, the reality is um, most of those guys probably get their turbos from big warehouse distributors. And those companies are great, you know, and they can do a lot of things. But we're different. We do two things for our customers. We create custom combinations and supply hard to find hardware. And every day we're helping professionals like you uh, make better decisions about turbocharging. We love turbochargers, and we can source any turbo a customer needs. We have arrangements with major OEM manufacturers to keep prices low, but most importantly, above all else, we crunch numbers, and we make sure that we get a match right. So we match, and turbocharger matching is the process of selecting the optimal compressor for an engine configuration to, to achieve your, your performance goals. And these requirements are different for every engine, and you know, if you're at, at sea level versus if you're at altitude, what type of racing you're doing, there's a lot 
that you really have to think about. But at the end of it all, we're trying to build trust and uh, relationships with customers, and you don't do that by, by selling the wrong hardware. And it really doesn't take much to stand out as better than the rest. You can provide a couple basic calculations that, that withstand you know, proof. It's mathematically correct, and, and the result backs it up. And so um, you can also do it in a time-efficient manner. But the reality is building race cars is a lot like baking a cake. There's a lot of different recipes and techniques to get the job done. Everybody here faces a highly competitive market, and no matter who you are or what you're doing, uh, performing a match is gonna help you get a better result. You can reduce the risk with your clients, and you can get it right the first time. So if you're serious about racing, making decisions based on an accurate match will help you win championships. So um, our genius friend Brock from Borg Warner created some software that we're gonna talk about, and it's, it's kind of a game changer. So here's Matt to explain a little bit more about that. All right, now that we've got our little uh, shameless plug over with, I'm going to tell you about what we call the shortcut match. If I can figure out how to operate a slideshow, there we go. The purpose of the shortcut match is to really quickly and easily ballpark a compressor match for a customer. In this case, we want to know how a specific engine will perform with a given turbo and we want to consider the most extreme operating conditions that the engine's going to see. So there's roughly five pieces of information or inputs that you need to do this match, and they are the power goal that the customer has, the turbo configuration, whether they're using single or twin turbos, engine displacement, the fuel type that the engine's going to be running on, and the maximum boost pressure. Now, the maximum boost pressure is a little bit iffy. It's not necessary to know it, but it's an important consideration for what fuel you're going to be using, or if your engine's stock or built, or if you have high or low compression. But uh, the matching tools will help narrow down the, the boost pressure you're going to need to meet your goal anyway. And then maybe as important, maybe more important than the five inputs, you need to know what the car is going to be used for. So are they drag racing? street driving, time attack, autocross. You need to know what the car is going to be used for, and you need to know where the car is going to be used. So the climate, elevation, and that's enough to get you going on to the match. So this is a screenshot from BorgWarner's Matchbot uh, software, and it looks kind of complicated if you're not familiar with turbo matching, but the pieces of information highlighted in yellow is all you really need to do for a ballpark match. So I put an example together. I figured someone's got like a junkyard LS or LS-based engine, 5.3 liter, single turbo, 75 Fahrenheit. They live at 500 feet of altitude and they're gonna use pump gas and they're hoping to make 700 horsepower. So information goes into the yellow cells and you can start looking at compressor maps. The map on the right is an old cast wheel S300 Borg Warner Airworks turbo, and that's clearly not going to cut it. We've fallen way off the efficiency and you're getting pretty close to the max speed as well, so that's a bad choice. On the left, we have an S300 SXE. It's for the conditions that we've put in, it's probably a pretty safe match. We're getting kind of close to the, the end of the efficiency islands there, but it should get the job done. And then these are Matchbot's calculated outputs. Uh, it's kind of intimidating looking, but there's really only two pieces of information that you need to pay attention to here. There's the two at the bottom, which shows the estimated power, and you can kind of adjust your boost input um, as you're working through it to make sure you're gonna achieve your goal. And then it also tells you the pressure ratio that you're gonna to need to make the power and the mass flow of the turbocharger and engine. So with this piece of information, you can also look at other manufacturers' turbochargers. So I've pulled two Garrett turbos here. And the way I picked these was uh, two options that had similar wheel sizes to the Airworks Turbo from the few slides back. So the G42 1200 Compact, the wheel sizes were closest to the Airworks, but I kind of feel like the G40 1150 is 
a better match. The G42 1200 compact, you're sitting at say 76% efficiency, but in kind of lower boost, or as you're transitioning through the, the rev range, you're gonna be pretty far on the left side of the map. So you're not really using the map very effectively. And we've also picked a zona rotor. So again, I picked this based on the wheel sizes, not necessarily the best match for the application, just to sort of show the differences that you get from one manufacturer to another. So this option's kind of falling off on the efficiency as well, but I mean, you can see that this turbo is really kind of intended for high mass flow at higher pressure ratios. It's, it's really efficient up there, but similar wheel sizes to the other options, maybe not the best for this situation. If you don't want to use the Matchbot method, Garrett has their own software called Boost Advisor, and it's, it's probably the most simple method for a customer to use to generate a list of potential options that they might want to consider. You input the same five pieces of information, and it just spits out a list of, of Garrett turbos that might work. I thought it was kind of interesting that you put the same inputs in as Matchbot, and it also suggested the G40-1150 and the G42-1200 compact. So once again, it's super important to understand how your customers are different and what they're gonna be using their turbo or their engine for. And I've got a couple examples here to illustrate that point. So this is the same Airworks turbo we selected initially. On the left, it's at the 500 feet of elevation we started at, and the right map is at the top of Pikes Peak. And you can see how quickly it went from probably an acceptable match to you're probably gonna fail your turbo. Um, to note, I also only put 6,000 RPM in as the max engine speed for this example. So if you're gonna rev the engine higher, that Airworks turbo is gonna run out of steam and probably also still be a bad match. So it was really good for those really specific parameters of 6,000 RPM, 700 horsepower, 500 feet of elevation and pump gas. And we really haven't given ourselves much room for the customer to drive the truck or car at elevation or if they have a small boost leak And then another situation we have here is two very different engines that are making the same power. They're both requiring about 44 pounds per minute of mass flow, but one's a five liter V8 and one's a two liter four cylinder. And you can see they're directly in line with each other on the mass flow axis, but they require very different pressure ratios to make that power. And in the case of the two liter, this might be a su suitable turbo, but for the five liter, you've kind of fallen off the efficiency again, so it's probably not the best choice, and that's where understanding what the customer is trying to do is, is really important. So I've got a couple case studies here. These are times we've done a bit more of a long form matching method using Matchbot and all of the inputs rather than just kind of sticking to one column and doing a basic match. Uh, I'm not gonna run through the entire setup of that because I think we'd probably get kicked off stage and everyone would fall asleep or something, but if anyone's interested to know more about these case studies or how we did the long match, feel free to come talk to us at our booth after the presentation. So our first case study is Papadakis Racing and their B58 Supra Formula Drift Car. Uh, they came to us with a new platform, new engine, at the time, it hadn't really been modified very much, and they wanted to build something competitive for the Formula Drift Championship. So it started off as a three liter, they ended up going to a 3.2 liter, but we had to do this. This was actually also in the middle of COVID, so uh, Jeff was in Arizona, I was actually in Canada at the time, and Papadakis was in California, so it was, a, it was an interesting, mashup of communication and everyone working in different locations, but we were able to get through it. So for that car, we were looking at an EFR 9280. It was using a 1.05 AR twin scroll external wastegate turbine housing. 
they targeted 36 PSI of boost, and they ended up making 1,033 horsepower. Um, so, uh, I guess I should probably also note that uh, with this setup, they ended up um, podium in their first event. I think they came first, right? First event, and then they went on to win two championships in a row. So we're pretty, pretty proud of that result. This is another output from Matchbot, and it's the turbine, um, the turbine housing Matchbot. So, so you can look at the different turbine housing options, sorry, and you can adjust your parameters to determine whether or not a particular turbine and housing combination is going to be suitable for what you're trying to achieve. And then here we have Matchbot's calculated outputs again, and kind of interesting note, Matchbot estimated that it would make 1,029 horsepower and was pretty much bang on. Here's the, uh, the dyno plot. So it's pretty cool to see how accurate Matchbot can be if you have the right inputs for it. Uh, once the turbo was selected, it was on us to do our connect the dots between the turbo and the, uh, the engine routine. And so I've got a few pictures of what we came up with. The top view, front view, and the side of their championship winning setup. Once we had the CAD model of the manifold done, we did some 3D printing so that Steph could test fit everything and make sure he was happy. And there you have it. Our second case study was for a Pikes Peak Honda K20 engine in a Wolf GB08 chassis. Uh, the sole intent of this platform is power to weight ratio. The, the thing is, it weighs nothing. It's like 580 kilograms, I think, and it's capable of over 600 horsepower. So uh, Robbins won Pikes Peak three out of four years, and it's largely thanks to power to weight ratio. Now, Pikes Peak is a really interesting situation because you're starting at the bottom of the event at 5,000 feet of elevation, and you're racing to 14,000 feet of elevation, and that has a massive impact on how the turbocharger operates. So you can see here we've plotted out the EFR 8370, which was actually a, it's kind of a funny combination, but it was something that BorgWarner released specifically for this or it was developed for this platform and released as a product afterwards. So we're looking at 75 Fahrenheit, two liter, 8,500 RPM, and two bar of boost. However, once we reach the top of Pikes Peak, if everything remained the same, that, that turbo's failed a long time ago. So you kind of have to have a complicated boost control strategy for Pikes Peak, but when you get it right, we have 5,000 feet of elevation, 30 PSI, everything is good. He's just on the map still. He's actually using pretty much all of the available map there. And then at the summit, it's only 20 PSI, but he's actually operating in the exact same area of the compressor map, which is kind of cool, I think. And here he is on the podium. Now I'm going to pass you back to Jeff, and he's going to just kind of do a big brain dump of all of his uh, 20 years of 20 years plus of turbo knowledge. Yeah, thanks, Matt. So that's matching in a nutshell. Um, I'm just going to start sharing some harder knowledge with you guys. Maybe you know it, maybe you don't. I uh, hope you learned something. But there are a few free lunches in turbocharging, uh, a few areas where you can get a whole lot of power with no compromise. So hopefully this will help you guys with your work. Uh, to start, there's two types of turbocharger bearings. There's ball bearings, also known as cartridge bearings, and there's journal bearings. Journal bearings are the most popular turbo kind of bearing by far because it's cheap, and that is why they dominate OE turbocharger production. Dual ball bearings, that's what this thing is here, provide a substantial reduction in friction. So it's about one half of the power consumption of a journal bearing. So this increases turbine efficiency. And what that means is when the exhaust pulse hits the wheel, it spins it a little bit more just because there isn't the friction um, to slow it down. But it's important to realize that that is really an issue at slower shaft speeds. Once the turbo's up on boost, 
it, it's really a wash. So in this chart, you can see the green line is the ball bearing, the red line is the journal bearing. The ball bearing, like when you breathe on them, they just spin. And um, a journal bearing has, has quite a bit more friction due to that thrust washer. Um, but overall, the efficiency enhancement will, will improve the spool up and the transient response. Um, so the result is faster time to boost. So as soon as you map that throttle, it comes on quicker. And the number is about 7 to 15 percent, uh, how much faster a ball bearing comes on. And that's a big deal. Uh, 15 percent is massive. Uh, but keep in mind, drag racers are typically in boost from the second that they launch until the trap. So oftentimes, drag racers aren't going to get a huge benefit from a ball bearing, especially if they're on auto training. Uh, the state of the art in ball bearings right now is um, really this configuration right here. So it's called a ceramic ball bearing. But very specifically, the race, the big chunk of steel on the left, that's made of a military grade material called M50. The balls are ceramic. And then the cage is aluminum that's plated in silver so it doesn't gall. And if you compare that to most ball bearing turbos, they're typically a plastic cage, a steel ball, and a stainless race. So that's, that's really kind of a difference. So a, a, Exotic racing turbos probably going to have that, that cartridge on the left. And some maybe an older style ball bearing or maybe a lower cost ball bearing will probably have the plastic cage on the right. Um, but these um, bearings are actually floating in the turbo. They used to be press fit. And now what, what people are doing is um, you're, you're floating this in a, in a cushion of oil. And it hydrodynamically damps any of the shaft motion and the vibration through the turbocharger. And it's, it's pretty new. but the, the coolest thing about the ball bearings is they're remarkably tough. If you pop a motor and eat an oil pump or contaminate your oil, do all these things, a ceramic ball bearing will oftentimes chew through those contaminants and it's usually fine. They're unbelievable how strong they are. It's a lot stronger than I think anybody had anticipated when we started using them. And another factor is if um, you're on a journal bearing and you're thrust loading your turbo. So there's a variety of different ways we'll, we'll get into in a few minutes about um, surge and the amount of force. So thrust is when the turbo shaft is pushed this way. On a journal bearing, it has a thrust washer that, that loads that surface up. And that thrust washer can be overwhelmed. On a ball bearing, there is no thrust surface. And we know this can handle at least 10 times more thrust than a traditional journal bearing. But we don't really know how much. We can't break them in thrust. So uh, our thrust rig maxes out, and, and we can't fail a, a ball bearing turbo. But um, it's pretty remarkable how, how durable the ball bearings really are. Oil pressure is a big topic. And the reason is anybody who's building a race engine is probably using a lot of oil pressure on their cranks, their cams, whatever. And a lot of oil pressure is not great on a turbo. High oil pressure actually acts like a brake on the turbocharger shaft. So it, it slows it down. You can do a test in the lab, just spin this thing at 100 PSI and it stops fast. Spin it at 15 to 40 PSI and it's like this. And so really the sweet spot is considered about 18 to 45 PSI. And um, a really cool product we like is the TurboSmart OPR. It's the inline, no return, oil pressure regulator. In the past, a lot of people would use a restrictor. You can see that on the left. And many turbos still do have restrictors. That's, that's pretty much fine. But you definitely don't want to put a restrictor on top of a restrictor. And the problem with the restrictor is if the oil's cold or if it's thin, you get all these variabilities. But the oil pressure regulator is a static for PSI. And it really does improve turbocharger performance overall. Uh, we have seen people run 15 PSI like on side-by-sides. Not recommended, but it works, and we haven't seen a failure yet on a ball-bearing turbo, specifically. Uh, another topic that causes a lot of confusion is water-cooling turbochargers. And I think there's a lot of misunderstandings because people are used to water-cooling, keeping an engine cool while it's operating. But water-cooling does nothing on a turbo while the engine's on. The water pump is you know, flown uh, the, the fluid through. But the difference from temperature in to temperature out while an engine's on is like a degree and a half Fahrenheit. It's almost nothing. Water cooling is exclusively for when you shut the engine off. There's so much heat contained in this turbine wheel that starts soaking back through the shaft and into the bearing. And what water cooling does is it introduces something called thermal siphoning. So you want the water to come in the bottom and out the opposite side top. There's two different types of of housings here, but the key is it needs to come in the bottom and out the opposite side top. And the reason is heat rises. So as the water is transferring heat out of the bearing housing or out of the turbine into the water, it actually pulls water through the turbo and through the whole cooling system of the engine, even though the water pump's not moving. And what that does is it really helps um, keep bearings alive. But I'll be honest, there is 
if you're endurance racing, it, it's brainless. If you're using an alloy center section, you have to water cool. But if you have an iron center section, which most turbos are, and a really good bearing, you can actually get away with no water cooling at all. It's just really important to either run a turbo timer or let your car idle down for about 90 seconds after a hard boost event. Otherwise, you can definitely beat, um, beat the bearing housings up a little bit. Compressor wheels. This is a topic people get really excited about. Um, billet wheels, they look nice. Uh, I get it, they're, they're so damn cool. But um, the blade shape, the tool paths, and the designers who create these blade shapes, there's a lot that goes into these. And not all billet compressors are created equally. So modern racing turbos use forged hunks of billet that then get machined. It's not just like bar suck. These are actually forged into shape and then they're machined. Um, and they do offer a strength improvement over cast wheels, which is probably the reason why they're popular in OE. But the reason that these are popular in performance is they allow you to, to iterate. You can change things really quickly without having to invest in casting tooling and all the time that that entails. But there's a few different types of compressor wheel styles. This one here is a six plus, excuse me, a seven plus seven. So there's seven primary, and then there's seven splitters behind it. Uh, there's some turbos that are 11 primary with zero splitters, five primary with five splitters. And there's no rules of thumb. There's no rhyme or reason. You can have a five plus five outflow a seven plus seven. Um, really, it, it comes down to who created that compressor design. And the reality is there are PhD aerodynamicists, like guys who are way nerdier than me and Matt who are doing this stuff. And it is complex. These guys went to college for like 10 years and they're doing some seriously advanced stuff. So. Um, compressor design is very challenging. There's no like, oh, I think that'll work and it works. It, it never works out like that. It's always a surprise. But you can also do a super minor, almost inconsequential change and, and gain three or 4% right off the top of compressor wheel performance. So uh, like we said before, racers wanna know that what they're, what they're doing is going to make a difference. And so I feel like if you're not using a compressor map, it's, it's kind of a guessing game. Uh, trim is a really, big question mark in people's minds that I think is a little bit unclear, but it's actually just a percentage. And it's the relationship of the inducer squared divided by the exducer squared. And the reason they call it trim is you are actually trimming this thing down. Uh, but for years, the 50 trim, 57 trim, maybe even up to a 60 trim would be considered uh, normal. And what we're seeing now is all the performance turbos are going way bigger on an inducer and they're going smaller on exducer. And it takes quite a bit of aero um, to, to make this work, but the advantage here is we're moving a lot more air with a lot less inertia. So it's actually a wheel that's smaller on the exducer and bigger on the inducer. And the exducer is where your inertia is. So you can have mass on the inducer and it, it barely matters, but have it on the exducer and, and you're gonna slow that, that turbulence performance down. Uh, and then on the, on the turbine side, it's just the opposite. So inducer is where the air goes in and exducer is where the air exits. And on the turbine, you enter on the outer diameter and you exit on the inner diameter. It's the exact opposite of a compressor. Compressor housings are really straightforward. Uh, in general, a bigger AR is a better thing. Um, sometimes you might not get a gain, but more often than not, a larger AR compressor housing will yield a performance gain over a smaller one. And with almost no negative feedback or a ne negative side effect. The issue with the large compressor housing is they get really hard to fit. And um, one small side note is uh, all Indy cars run two EFR 7163s and that's a two and a half inch inlet. And you could run that turbo with a two and a half inch in intake tube. It makes sense, it's two and a half inch. It, and the thing's operating in surge the whole time. It, it's a nightmare. They put it on three, it gets a little better. And then you run it on three and a half inch intake tube, which seems crazy to run that big of a diameter on this little two and a half inch inlet, and it, it's operating pretty well. Now, if you go to a ported shroud, and if you could kind of see that, that turbo on the left and, and also the, the one right next to it, there's a groove on the compressor inlet. It's called a research slot, and that gives you way more surge margin. It gives you kind of a, you can see on that map, that whole red line that bumps out, that's all from the ported shroud. And if you're I mean, if you're doing anything in a turbocharger that's really pushing it to limit a small engine with big turbo, um, it, it really does help to give you uh, that, that additional surge margin. But the reality is, is almost anybody who's racing is using a turbo that's mathematically too big for that engine. And as new turbos start to come out, um, 
e-turbos especially, electronic turbos, they can make so much boost down low that the engine can't ingest it. And so it's just gonna drive these things into surge. And so the two tricks to get around this, one is the ported shroud, which helps a little bit. And another trick that's pretty new, this is just coming up in the last year, is people are attaching very tiny drive-by-wire throttle bodies. You can put it on the intercooler or the charge pipe, but you're creating a very tiny boost leak. And what that allows you to do is take yourself completely out of surge. And it also allows you to get turbo speed way up. So you can create a pretty substantial boost leak, get your turbo speed way up, and then slam that thing shut. And you know, then you're really, uh, you're making some, some boost at that point. You got some turbo speed. Uh, the turbine wheel is probably the least understood part of a turbo. And the reason is turbine wheels are even more complex than compressor wheels. And for years, uh, most turbine wheels kind of were very similar. I would say until about 2012 is when the, um, the turbine wheel technologies really started to, to change. But turbines are also known as expanders. And so on the compressor side, we, we have what's called the pressure ratio. Well, on the turbine side, we call the pressure ratio the expansion ratio. And it's because the high pressure exhaust entering the turbine leaves at a lower pressure. So it, it's actually expanding from that high pressure to the low pressure as it exits. Um, and a turbine wheel is also known as a shaft and wheel. And the reason is this shaft, which is made out of 4340 steel, is friction welded to the Inconel turbine. Um, it, it has to be because this is powering the compressor and you can't have any joints or any stressors because they will fail. At, at the exhaust temps that we're, we're seeing in gasoline engines, it's, it's pretty remarkable. So um, there are three different materials that you can make a turbine out of. The most common is Inconel 713C. So that's a nickel chrome super alloy, relatively cost effective, pretty durable, uh, a little heavy, works up to 950C. And um, it was typically used in commercial vehicles. It's made their way into to, uh, performance. And it is, without a doubt, the go-to for probably 90% of turbochargers out there. Drag racers love it. It's durable. Uh, it's cost effective. Makes a lot of sense. MARM is somewhere in the middle. That's pretty exotic of an alloy. It's a little bit more expensive than Inconel. Um, overall, it's stronger at higher temperatures. You can go thinner on the blades. You can go thinner pretty much everywhere and have a lower inertia, similar performing uh, turbine. You see it, actually, the new Raptors have MARM turbine wheels. A lot of these performance OEM cars are now getting MARM. And then there's Gamma Tie. And Gamma Tie is a really weird material. It's not a metal. It's not a ceramic. It's called a cerametallic. And um, it's actually weakest at room temperature. So if you drop it on the ground, it'll shatter. At 950C, it's the strongest. But very simply, these things are so light that it weighs the same as the billet aluminum compressor wheel. And for applications where response is paramount, not drag racing or land speed racing or anything like that, but um, rally, time attack, drift, anything that reduces the rotating mass of the turbocharger will allow it to accelerate more quickly. So um, these EFR turbos from Borg Warner are the only ones that we're aware of right now that use titanium aluminide. And they cut inertia by 50%. So when you feel one of these things behind the wheel, if you can do any sort of a back-to-back, -back, it's pretty remarkable. And what I have here are two identical turbine wheels. This one is Inconel 713C. This one's titanium aluminide. Everything is the same about them. When you hold these, if you guys want to stop by the booth later, you're welcome to. It's unbelievable how little this thing weighs compared to this, but everything else is identical. All right, turbine housings is definitely a big debate. Um, there's a few different ones. Stock location, before I get into these, stock location turbine housings are really popular right now. And for anybody who's in this space, you're probably aware of what's been going on with producing parts for streetcars. And the reality is if you're a kit builder, if you're supplying parts to customers who are gonna drive their cars on the street, you need to retain the catalyst in the stock position. And the only way you're gonna do that with turbocharging is putting a turbocharger that fits like stock in the stock location and bolts up to the stock cat. That is the only way to be compliant. And it's still difficult, but um, stuff like racing turbos, which is really what this session is about, it, it's pretty much impossible to be compliant with a racing turbo. So I think it's important to realize that if you're using racing turbos, uh, they need to go on racing cars. And if you're building street cars, they need to use stock location turbos. Um, so right off the bat, turbine housing AR will have a huge effect 
on the performance of a turbocharger. So you're going to want to size the AR to adjust the exhaust flow of the turbine wheel. And for most turbos, the 1.0 AR is considered the sweet spot. So at 1.0 AR, you have this perfect balance of efficiency and flow. As you go above 1.0 AR, your efficiency drops off as your flow goes up. As you go under 1 AR, it's just the opposite. Your flow goes down and your efficiency goes up. And a smaller turbine wheel will typically use a smaller AR, like some of these factory turbos might be a 0.35. It doesn't have any benefit to go bigger than that. And then a bigger turbine wheel will want to use a bigger AR. Um, we got some 1.45s and 1.6s, and they sound crazy large, but in the right application, it, it works extremely well. So um, one, one other point on this is the clearance between the turbine blade and the turbine housing can also have a huge effect. And the reason is you want that exhaust gas to drive the turbine wheel. It needs to come in and turn this thing around. But if the, if the gap is a little too big, the exhaust gases will slip around. And I know I've seen this in the past, testing various prototypes. If the machine shop or whoever built that turbo, if they machine that housing, 7,000 is too big, you're down 150 horsepower. And it's like, this turbo is junk. And it turned out it was just a machinist who got a little sloppy or whatever it was, but you got to keep that gap as tight as it can be, but also large enough to allow for the expansion during heating to make sure you don't get a wheel rub. You never, ever want these wheels to touch the housings. That is instant death to a turbocharger. And ideally, there would be zero clearance, but that's impractical. It, it's not going to work. So, uh, One of our favorite topics is exhaust manifold designs. I staked my reputation on this stuff back in the day, and really there's three main uh, exhaust style. So there's the longer runner tubular manifold that's on the left, like uh, we did for that Supra. We have that, that kit on display in our booth. And then there's on the right, um, there's a cast runner manifold that we make for the Raptors and F-150s next to the log manifold that is the OEM on the Raptor and F-150. And really that the log manifolds are, are predominant. You're going to see that in almost every factory car. And the reason is they're cheap. They're low cost. They have relatively poor performance, especially at higher RPMs, but they work well enough at low RPM. So for cost-conscious um, automakers, that is definitely cast iron logs is still the, the manifold of choice. Now, there's two different styles of the turbocharger manifolds. There's the open or undivided on the left, and then there's divided or twin scroll on the right. This is a project we did with Ford Motor Company when they were prototyping the 2.3 liter engine for the Focus RS and the Mustang. So they asked us to develop two different exhaust manifolds for these prototype engines. They would validate them in the lab with some CFD work. And uh, I actually learned a lot from this process. We had six PhD guys working with us. And um, it's kind of hard to see the graphs. But what, what those graphs represent is something called flow uniformity. And uh, what you want to think about is as the exhaust exits that collector and enters the turbine, how much turbulence is in there and what does that flow look like? And for a drag car, like I was saying before, when you're on boost from launch to traps, you don't need spool or response or transients or low end torque or any of the things that we're worried about um, for, the, for the drifter or response or rally guy. Undivided makes a lot of sense. And the reason is you don't have the wall friction from the divider. Having that divider in there means that the, the exhaust gases are going to be scrubbing on it. And that's not a big number, but it is about 3%, and 3% is not nothing. So if you're drag racing, more often than not, uh, that open, undivided manifold can, can be advantageous. But if you're drag racing, maybe a six-cylinder or a four-cylinder, maybe it's not very high RPM, um, the divided manifolds can, can have an improvement. So um, talking about the flow uniformity index, those are the graphs I was just showing a second ago. You can see them overlaid. So the, the purple and the, the kind of dark blue is the twin scroll. Those are the two separate banks, either side of the divider. And the, that red line is the undivided. And the, um, where it drops on the red line is because of the huge volume inherent in the undivided setups. This manifold, or excuse me, this engine was only revving to 6,000 RPM. If you were revving to 10,000 RPM, it would be a little bit different, and you'd probably be leaning toward the, the undivided. Uh, this is kind of just my own opinions of what I like to see. It drives me crazy when I look at a car and see some ridiculously large tube here and a small one there, but the rule of thumb is for an intake tube, bigger is better. If you could run a 10-inch intake tube on a little turbo, it's probably going to be fine. There's no such thing as too big on the intake tube. Charge pipes, you don't want to go too big. Bigger charge pipes or longer charge pipes, they hurt spool and they hurt response. I'd say every foot of charge pipe is about 300 RPM of spool. 
Um, and then also, when you go too big on diameter, you're just hurting spool with no big benefit. So overall, those are kind of the numbers that I think work really well for, for horsepower ranges and charge pipe diameters. Manifold runners, I've debated this till I'm blue in the face, but we've built so many turbo manifolds over the years. I don't know how too many shops that have built more than we have. But those are the numbers I like. I like 1.4 inch for 100 to 200 horsepower per cylinder, like 1.6 for 250 to 300, maybe 350 range, and then 1.9 inch for the crazy horsepower. We do almost no 1.9 inch. Now, if it's a rotary engine or a two port Supra engine where there's just two holes, um, it probably should say per port, but yeah, I mean, in a rotary engine or, or two port Supra engine, you're gonna be one of that 1.9 inch runner. But in general, uh, a big runner is not gonna help you at all. And uh, last but not least is downpipe and exhaust. Bigger is definitely better. So if you're in a race category like rally racing where you have to run a catalyst, you're gonna be advantageous to put that cat all the way at the end of the exhaust pipe, run the biggest piping you can up to it. And that's gonna do two things. It's gonna lower your back pressure when you're stabbing the throttle because you have so much volume inside this thing to fill up. And it's also gonna help the cat live. Like, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but when you run a, a car with a cat really hard with a turbo, cats tend to melt and fail. So um, if, you're, if you're really pushing things, you're gonna wanna move that cat back, which is not legal for OEM use. You have to keep the cat in the stock location for any vehicle get, that gets driven on the street. Wastegates, this is something also that is not well understood because in a perfect world, a perfect turbo setup would have no wastegate at all. A wastegate is literally wasting energy and that's why it's called a wastegate. You're actually taking the exhaust gas that should be driving that turbo and you're bypassing and just getting rid of it. And um, if you're you know, living in that perfect world but you use pump gas, you're gonna have a big problem because knock and pre-ignition detonation are gonna blow your block to smithereens. So, in traditional wastegates, you have to manipulate the behavior of it through springs and solenoids. You can do a soft spring so that it opens up, you know, gives you traction at, at kind of low boost levels, but that's going to get blown open at higher boost levels. You can use a stiff spring so that you can get all the boost it makes, but then it's not going to give you any traction at the low end. So there's a lot of ways to trick them and use CO2 and all sorts of other things, but the reality is an external wastegate is more often than not the most popular way a racer is going to plumb things. And I'll tell you straight up, a smaller wastegate is usually better. A lot of guys use very large wastegates, and the problem is when you run an oversized wastegate, as soon as that thing cracks and the valve lifts off the seat, you lose so much exhaust pressure and so much turbine speed that by the time it closes, it takes a minute for that thing to, not a minute, but you know, a lot longer than we'd like for that thing to come back up. Whereas if it was a small wastegate, it, it's, it's, it's quick. You know, it's super quick response. Uh, the problem with a small wastegate is if it's too small and you're trying to run low boost, you're gonna have boost creep which means it's easier for the exhaust to drive the turbine than it is to exit the wastegate. So there is a sweet spot here, but I mean, we are usually trying to say, keep it small, keep it within reason, unless, you know, the, the front wheel drive drag race guys, they have no traction. So they're trying to keep the wastegates open first, second, halfway into third, you know, but overall, smaller wastegate will help you. Uh, just quick match from Matchbot. Um, this is a 700 horsepower Subaru I did at 36 PSI, just a simple example. And it is remarkable how little waste gating occurs on a high boost, high horsepower engine. This is saying all you need is a 26 millimeter waste gate. And I don't even know a waste gate that, that's, that's that small. So, um, you know, it's remarkable. But if you're trying to do 400 horsepower on that same turbo and run a lot less boost without boost creep, then that's when you need the, the bigger waste gate. So it really pays to think about what is the setup and, and build it appropriately. Uh, internal wastegates, I was talking before about the stock location stuff. So if you're doing any streetcar stuff, you need to be internally wastegated. If you're externally wastegated and you're running a dump tube or a recirc, it, it brings on a lot of challenges. They often crack. It's a whole lot of fabrication work. And making kits with internal wastegates is a lot less labor. But internal wastegates do have some challenges and the future that we're seeing right now is the electronic wastegate. Almost every factory car that's coming out from the factory is now dead reliable with electronic wastegate. And the beauty of this thing is you can have it open when you want it open and you have it closed when you want to close. It's completely independent of whatever the engine's doing or whatever mechanical forces are going on. Uh, we're really excited about these. We've been making adaptation kits to fit these wastegates on a variety of different racing turbos, EFRs, uh, Garrett G-Series. And this is the setup that Robin Shoot ran on that Pikes Peak car Matt was talking about. In order to get the exact boost control we wanted all the way at the bottom and all the way at the top, we were running this 
this actuator. And this is an off-the-shelf Honda part for a Honda Civic Type R. It's available in three lengths. So there's Honda Civic Type R is a 12 millimeter stroke. A Raptor is a 19 millimeter stroke. And then the new Supra and the BMWs are a 21 millimeter stroke. We like the 12 millimeter stroke because it has the most clamping force. And the reason is, is the, the motor has the most torque on the worm drive. So it's a slightly different final drive gear ratio. But overall, a Civic Type R actuator on a racing turbo is a really nice way to control boost. Heat blankets, coatings, and wraps, they really do work uh, surprisingly well. When you keep the heat contained inside the turbocharger, it increases your turbo efficiency and um, also your turbo shaft speed. And the result of that is just it's higher boost for a given engine speed. So where you might have 13 PSI, now you can get 14 for free just because you're keeping the heat in there. And that is effectively can affect your time to torque. So the OEs are really worried about this. You know, when you stab that throttle, how long does it take for that thing to come up? And it is surprising what a turbo blanket um, kind of insulating the whole system can do. All right, so that's the fun stuff. The next three slides are going to teach you, well, not teach you, but talk about how not to break your turbo. FOD, foreign object damage, it's probably the most common thing we see. The left side is a compressor, maybe it's sucked in a socket, electrical conductor, rocks, children, all sorts of stuff get sucked in compressors. But more often than not, we see turbine FOD. And turbine FOD can be spark plugs, valves, pistons, something that got sucked through the engine and blasted out the other side. It is definitely an issue. And when your turbine looks like that, when it's been fodded up, your turbo is done. You, you, yeah, there's no saving it. The efficiency is so far off. It's like 25, 30% off. It'll still work, but it's hurt. Tip speed and speed sensors is another topic that isn't really understood. And I, I think this comes down to the fact that people think about rotational speed and RPM. And when you have a wheel that th that's this big, it might be able to spin at 120,000 RPM. I think that's what the max limit of this one is. But if you have this huge wheel on it, that thing can only spin 80 or 70,000 RPM. And uh, I heard two good examples I'll share with you guys. One is to think about a car with very tiny uh, tires on it. And if you have super tiny tires in your car, that engine and that dry shaft have to spin so fast to get that vehicle to move 60 miles per hour. Another example of tip speed is a weed whacker. If you only extend that, that string like a little bit, it's like barely doing anything. Put a foot of, of rope hanging out and it's, it's causing some damage. And you want to think about it the same way. When you grow that uh, exduce of the compressor, it is moving some air as opposed to something smaller. So overall, tip speed is a critical uh, measurement in keeping your turbo alive. So all the OEMs use pretty much the same number, which is considered 560 meters per second. And nobody here or anybody really in the performance world cares about what that means because at the end of it, you're trying to turn this thing into RPM. And what that sensor is doing is it's actually counting blades. So every time this thing passes, it, it sees on that a spike. And it, it produces a frequency in hertz. And you can tell pretty safely of how fast your turbo is rotating. And this gives you a lot of information. This tells you where you're operating on the map. You can solve backwards to figure out your volumetric efficiency. You can really um, know a lot about your engine just from how fast your turbo is spinning. But also, really importantly, is if you have a boost leak and you're pushing your car hard, you're going to blow your turbo up. It's going to overspeed. And so a turbo speed sensor should immediately be able to alert you. You have a problem. You need to slow your turbo down. And um, we've seen this for years. You know, a lot of turbos don't come set up with a little bung for a speed sensor. And if it isn't set up for a speed sensor, you're not going to put a speed sensor in. It's so much work to try and adapt a speed sensor to a, a turbo that doesn't have one set up. So in that upper right corner, you can see it's a photo. That's a Borg Warner and a Garrett. They both use the same exact style speed sensor. And it's just plug and play. So in my opinion, uh, if you're going to push a turbocharger to the limit, you should consider the speed sensor mandatory. Turbine failure. Uh, turbos can be really dangerous. And when these things are spinning at a lot of speed, 560 meters per second, especially if it's a big turbo, when that thing comes apart, if, especially if it's a dyno room, maybe there's people standing around, or even at a track, people can get hurt. And so if you're using something that hasn't been validated by a major OEM, you know, most of the small turbo manufacturers don't have millions of dollars of infrastructure and gas stands and the ability to blow turbos up and see what happens. It, it's a lot. And um, I have known people who've had turbos come apart and 1,700 degree shrapnel buried itself 
from head to toe. I have a friend who is next to a diner room. The shrapnel went through the wall of the diner room and blasted it. And the reality is um, you really need to avoid turbine failure at all costs. Even if the blast is contained, overspeeding a turbo is the surefire way to have a turbine burst. It, you know, breaking a turbo is bad, but people getting hurt is, is a whole lot worse. So I really do believe that you know, this, this should be a message. If people are, are pushing turbos hard, run a speed sensor, watch your speeds. And to give you an idea of how much energy is in a turbine burst, uh, there's an article on Garrett where they calculated the amount of energy in a GTX 55. And it's the equivalent of 11 bullets from a 350 Magnum, for, fired at point blank range. And it is, you know, it, it's really hard to realize what 1700 degree shrapnel with that kind of force can do. So it, it's critical that you ensure proper operation and we only use and sell turbos that can contain this burst. Turbocharger piston rings, AKA seals, is another thing that most people don't understand. We get calls all the time, my seals are bad. And the reality is a turbo seal is nothing like a crankshaft or a camshaft seal that's made out of rubber. Those seals would melt very quickly um, when they're exposed to these temps. So I don't have one here, we've got one back in the booth. You wanna think of the, the turbine um, seal and also the compressor seal, like a piston ring. It's just a little C and it, it com compresses in the bore to a very small end gap. And um, it, it's very similar to a piston ring in a cylinder. Modern racing turbos use dual rings, so two rings next to each other. And um, the problem is, is, is if you excessively overheat these things or you do hot shutdowns, like I was talking about the importance of water cooling or idling down, you can have the spring actually get cooked and it'll relax itself and it'll lose its springiness. So once that deformation is, um, has happened, that's called ring collapse and the turbocharger is no longer able to contain the oil pressure inside the bore, it's gonna leak out. So overall, cooling the turbocharger down before you shut the engine off, if you don't have water cooling, has to happen. Now, if you do have water cooling, this is usually not, a, not an issue. But the good news is, more often than not, the seals are not collapsed. This is very rare. It takes so much abuse. Most gas engines can't do it. Diesel engines can, can do this. But um, usually when a customer calls us and says their, their seals are bad and their turbo is spoken, I'd say it's close to 90% of the time they have a kink in their oil drain line, maybe some blockage, maybe they have excessive crankcase pressure, but something is making it so that the turbo can't drain oil, that the oil's just staying in it. And as soon as you fix that issue, fix the kink or fix the crankcase, whatever it is, that turbo's fine, it's gonna stop smoking. Um, finally, here's a small checklist we have, um, just kind of put some thoughts together, summarizing this whole thing, but you know, overall, kind of hoping you guys take something away from this chat. If you have questions, you're welcome to come talk to us. But in general, a bigger turbo is usually better. Bigger pre and post turbo piping is usually better, but not for manifolds or charge piping. Back pressure is the enemy of volumetric efficiency. And drag racers don't really need to care about spooler response, especially if they're running an eight or a 10 speed transmission. So uh, in the case of a time attack or a drift application, rally application, those are all response and transients. You know, you really need to think about what, what the customer is doing with the, with the engine. So that's our presentation. Hope it was valuable for you guys, you learned something. Um, if you don't mind, scan the QR code. We're gonna do a, a contest on Saturday to win a free turbo. And we're actively seeking new dealers, you know? So if whoever you guys get turbos from, if they don't have something, give us a call. Good chance we do have it. You know, we'd love to be your first call, but we'll settle for the second. And um, yeah, we'll open up for Q&A now. Um, also, I think there's like some QR codes in the back of the seat. PRI asked if you could, um, scan the QR codes and rate, rate our presentation. We'd really appreciate it. So yeah, anybody have questions, feel free to ask. If you've got a turbo running on gas and you switch to E85, what characteristics in the turbo could be compromised or what do you need to E85 is a pretty amazing material. Um, when you're switching from gas to E85, overall your EGT goes down, your knock resistance goes way up, and your exhaust mass flow goes up because you're burning so much more fuel. So E85 is pretty amazing in a turbocharged vehicle. I would say in general, what's gonna happen is the guy who's running the E85 is gonna wanna run a lot more boost than the guy who is running pump gas. So it's not anything I, I guess the issue would be if you, if you sized your turbo 
and you're running it at the limit on gas, and then you switch to E85 and try and push it harder, you're gonna, you're gonna end up in a bad spot. Like if, if, you, if you're maxing your turbo out already, you're, you're like way on the right side of the map on gasoline, and then you go, oh, I've got E85 now, I can, I can crank up the boost control some more, there's a good chance you're gonna overspeed just because of that additional mass flow through the, through the turbine. I have a question. Sure. Early on in the presentation, you were showing the, the different maps, the different mapping, and it had several different points on it. Mm -hmm. uh, what do those different points represent? I don't necessarily understand. Engine that. RPM. Engine RPM, so yeah. it's just RPM different points, and it's showing the different efficiencies based on that map. Yeah, where your particular engine RPM at wide open throttle, what that's gonna look like. So. Okay. Um, you're going to have a different volumetric efficiency point. You're going to have a different boost level, right? Because you're not making max boost at low RPM. And so you want it to scale in and scale out. And one of the things that I really like to see is I like to use the entire map. And the reason is you're not going to be in the peak efficiency at max RPM, but you are going to be in the peak efficiency at max torque. And anything you can do at maximum brake torque to have a little bit more knock resistance is gonna help you. So if you're operating in the, the peak efficiency zone at max torque, you're having a little bit cooler air entering the motor, or entering the intercooler. So the intercooler has to do less work. The, the motor's gonna be a little bit more knock resistant. So in general, why try to size turbos is make sure that the sweet spot's gonna coincide with your maximum brake torque point. Okay. One thing I forgot to mention, this was the full match and you see all those different points representing the different engine RPMs. When I did the shortcut match, I just set one through five to 100 RPM to just get them out of the way off to the side. Okay. So that's why the, the earlier maps looked a little bit funny with a pile of dots over on the left. That makes sense. We have a few YouTube videos too that can walk you through doing, doing the match, um, probably a 40 minute session. I'm happy to, to talk it over with you, but you know, it, it looks a little intimidating when you look at all these numbers on a sheet. And then you know, if you just kind of sit down and bang around a little bit, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Good presentation. I enjoyed it. Um, a couple of basic questions. Uh, where do you get the software that you're talking about, and where do you get the maps? Software is on BorgWarner's website. You can just type into Google Matchbot, okay. and it'll probably come up first. The maps, if they're BorgWarner, because this is BorgWarner's Matchbot, the maps are all there. But if you want to get them from Garrett, you have to go on Garrett's website, and you can just take... Actually, Matt, go back to the screen. Part of the shortcut match is that you get two outputs from this Borg Warner software that you can apply to any other. Um, the input screen? Yeah, there it is. Or oh, that's the output. So the very top right corner, no, that's, that's it, sorry. Okay. Calculated outputs. Very top right corner is your compressor pressure ratio. And then a little bit further down is your corrected airflow. Those are the two points you need to know. And as long as you have those two numbers, you can put it on a Garrett map or a Zona Rotor map or an MHI map, like any maps, as long as you have those numbers, the hard part's getting those numbers. That's the whole thing. So once you get the numbers out of the match bot, you can plot them on any map. But the amount of time it takes to have to do that manually is astronomical. So the, the match bot doesn't actually calculate where you're going to be given a particular turbo. It, you're telling it where you are, and then you're going to Given a particular out. engine. And yeah. then once we know how our engine's going to respond, then we're like, what does this turbo look like on that engine? What is this turbo? And you're just able to flip through. So the points are fixed. The points are your displacement, your elevation. Your right. boost level, right? That, that doesn't change. What does change is what does that engine look like? Yeah, but if you put a different turbo on a different engine, everything in the engine changes. So they're, they're interconnected. So is that, is that interconnection handled in match bot? You would have to go back and, and if it's a 5.0 or a 5.3 or just yeah, change the displacement. You kind of have to estimate a little bit um, like what, your, what boost you'll be able to achieve at a particular engine speed. So if you select a larger turbo on, on Matchbot, it's not gonna adjust like that boost response curve. You'll right. need to kind of manually adjust that. Yeah, cool, I'll have a speaker. It really, it comes down to knock resistance and, and mass flow. You're moving a lot more fuel in the exhaust system, 
when, when there's an alcohol flow, right? And um, they don't knock. You can run ignition advance. Pump gas, even lower octane race gases, you have to be on the ragged edge of, of knock if you're trying to make power. And so I think that's, it, it's, knock is just the worst possible thing when you're pushing an engine, a piston engine hard. So like on methanol, for instance, you know, the gains are going from ethanol to methanol, You might want to go bigger in the turbine housing AR in general, you know? Sizing up AR is a little bit of a black art. Uh, in this one, you see turbine match outputs. The row under it, exhaust manifold pressure, PSI, and then exhaust or engine delta pressure. The key here is really the engine delta pressure. In general, you want, ideally in a perfect world, to have more intake manifold boost pressure than exhaust manifold drive pressure. So say you're running 40 PSI in your drag car, you wanna have 38 PSI in the exhaust manifold because that's gonna give you a volumetric efficiency boost. That is just so much more air that's cramming in. Versus if you had 50 PSI in the exhaust for that 40 PSI, you're getting this reversion of exhaust gases getting pushed back into the, into the cylinder. Now alcohol engines, they're, again, they're really resistant to all sorts of stuff. So it's really hard to say, I would say in general that putting the time in to kind of spend some time on match part, especially on the more exotic engines and, and competitive drag. You know, it, it's not a quick thing and you're, you're not gonna get it right the first time, but you can get 70% the first time, maybe you get to 80%. And then as you start to collect data and look at engine speeds or depending on what kind of engine management you have, do you have a volumetric efficiency output? You know, if you really know your VE, it saves a lot of time. You know, a lot of time I'll work with customers and they have no idea what their VE is. And I gotta work backwards, look at their turbo speed, figure out where they're operating on their map. And then I'm like, oh, this is your VE, you know? And, um, I think it kind of depends on what the engine package is and what your knowledge and, and data acquisition level is or, or standalone fuel system is. Hope that answers your question. map stuff quite a bit, um, like when you guys did the super development, was that all you mapped out too as well? Well, you know, I, I mapped it once and they started running it and it worked. And then they made some changes and we checked it again and I said, hey, maybe we should look at this and maybe look at that. And um, I was talking about intake diameter with, with Papadakis actually two nights ago. I was like, hey, we're running a four inch intake tube. We did that in the name of time. I think we should look at a five inch intake tube. You know, he's not running an oil pressure regulator. I was like, I think we can get a little response out of this, the oil pressure regulator. So, you know, header wraps. Like, let's start doing little stuff next year because if we can get 4%, we'll take that. That, that car is pretty highly evolved and we still have a lot left on the table with it, so. I think that car also only has a three inch downpipe. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're gonna be on a four inch next season. Probably, you know, there's so much gains left in these things. And that car was slapped together in the name of time and we never had time to change anything. You know, it was just like what during the on season. When you, in a nitrous application, what does that do to, the, like when you look at a compressor map and you add that? Well, it, it's going to reduce your knock threshold and it's going to move more exhaust. So overall, if you're running a nitrous setup, you're probably going to have a little bit more back pressure when nitrous is on. It's, it's harder on the motor. No surprise, right? Yeah. yeah. But was that, so that, that was without any nitrous? Yeah, yeah. We don't, we don't put nitrous. Okay. I, I don't even have any idea how to calculate that. <laughs> <laughs> So on the electric blow up valve controllers, is it just universal to where like they all will run like the, the Raptor one or the Honda one? Oh, electronic wastegate controllers. Yeah. So really we're set up for the Honda. I'm pretty sure it would work with either one, but honestly, I, I don't think there's any real benefit to running more stroke. You know, I, more stroke is, it does weird things when you're using these electronic, because they don't have any misalignment. Like this thing has to be perfectly straight. And when you're moving long distances, there's gonna be like variation. So the shorter stroke with increased clamping force is, is definitely advantageous. We have a, a display where the thing's moving in different steps in our booth, you can check it out. And if you wanted to like, let's say add the Honda one and the controller, like roundabout, what are you talking like? It's probably $600. I think the controller is like 300 and actuator is probably 300. Gotcha. Yeah, you know, a normal internal wastegate is probably half that price so yeah. it's double the price but the fact is they're really reliable you're not swapping springs you don't have diaphragm failures yeah. or worries about solenoids or hoses blowing off so yeah, this is some cool. some ecus can can run the actuators directly yeah and, natively but if you don't you're going to need a controller to, to control it so the controller just takes a normal pwm signal like any boost solenoid yeah. and it outputs this dc motor driver signal yep Oh, they pull some current. Are they similar to the e or quite a bit higher? Like the well, it's very similar. It's a little bit higher, though, because they're just seeing more, more force from the um, 
the lever arm of the wastegate. But yeah, it, it's an H-bridge controller, yeah. real similar, yeah. So if you have a standalone that can control a drive-by-wire throttle body that you're not using, or maybe two H-bridge outputs, then yeah, you can absolutely control one of these things natively. I know the, like the turbo smart ones are a current. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is that it? You mentioned this stuff yep. about the uh, green seal was uh, damaged by high temperature, and you said that uh, more likely it happened in the diesel application. Diesel exhausts are usually cooler. Yes, but the diesel performance guys, they run those turbos so hard. Hey, you know, a perfect case in point is a garbage truck. That thing is going boost, no boost, boost, no boost thousands and thousands and thousands of cycles per day. And that is so much harder on the turbochargers than, than what you see with a gas engine. So then the other question is, uh, you know, you talked about the waste gates a lot, but in diesels they use, you know, VGTs. You guys just... You're not going to be able to do VGT. And th this is like more of a gasoline kind of presentation. It's really hard to get VGT to live in a gasoline exhaust gas temp environment. They will survive in some gasoline instances when yeah, the... Normal closer, but it's, you're, you're past the limit. So the vein pack, which is opening and closing, they bind up. And even ethanol, you're, you've exceeded the limit. Diesel is really lit. Now there are gasoline VGTs, the Porsche, new Porsche 911 turbos for the last probably six, seven, eight years, maybe even more than that at this point, um, have all been VGT. And um, they are really difficult to control. So most, same with e-turbos, most of these new technologies we're seeing on, on the OE side, it's probably going to be a little while till you see them on the performance side because the control systems are so complex. You know, most people aren't even comfortable with an electronic wastegate or electronic blow-off valve, right? And that's such a simple device. And now we're, we're talking about some very complex logic and control. So I, I think it'll happen. It might be eight-ish years from now, but you know, like I said, I really do believe this is the golden age of turbocharging. I believe that e-turbos are going to happen probably by the year 2030. We'll, we'll have some in the aftermarket but it's still a little ways away. Have you got any fuel mapping of, of the ECUs on turbocharged motors like Robin's motor? I'm sorry, what was that? Well, I was at high speed, tuned in one of the other cars. Okay. Um, if you're coming several downshifts into a tight turn, right, and all of a sudden you find yourself at 5,000 RPM again, turbos idling, they all just run, the acceleration enrichment is completely different than a 5,000 mm. RPM quick short shift. Do you know, are these people watching turbine speed and having different acceleration enrichment logics based on... What they're doing is they're, they're, they're watching shaft speed and they're using it as a feedback loop. And really when shaft speed starts coming up, they're using that to drive to a different map with less less weight, um, excuse me, more waste gating, right? So, so they're keeping the waste gate open more as shaft speed goes up. I'm talking acceleration arrangement in the... Oh, yeah, I, I have nothing to do with that. I, we just do the turbo. <laughs> That's it. All of a sudden, I've got a 1,500 horsepower high-speed car that I'm trying to tune, changing 5,000 foot of elevation. What, what ECU are you using? That was a Haltech. Okay. I know that they were. Robin was on a different ECU. He's now on the MoTeC. And the difference, so that was the first year we were on a different ECU and a different turbo. And then on year two, we switched. And then on year three, we went to the 8370. It's definitely been a learning curve with them, but they've made a lot of changes. So the MoTeC, I mean, every, nobody can get them right now, but I mean, there's no secret. They work really well. So I, I know that he's done things that I don't think would be possible to do. With Look at Papadakis. I mean, he's... He's running MoTeC now too for the same reasons. We've tried other ECUs previously and the MoTeC works perfectly every time. Was that HPA? I think, yeah. Andre? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, yeah, he gets into their boost control strategy in that too. It's pretty interesting. Yep. Yeah, we got our hands so full with the turbo stuff, I'm just like, oh, leave me out of that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want anything to do with it. All right, everyone. Well, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate you guys coming to see our session. Good job. Cool. Thank you.